Morning, April and Jeff and Joyce. We got a different camera angle today. Thought we'd show the backyard since it's really nice out today so far. Morning, Sylvia. Morning, Mike. Good morning, Link. Good morning again there, Sylvia. This is really cool on this app because I can see people checking in. And of course, I don't have enough mental bandwidth to, to call out everybody, but um, you know, I appreciate everybody logging on here. Oh, there's Julie. Morning, Julie. We'll give everybody a couple more minutes here to get logged in. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Julie commented too. Nice view. That's that's my backyard, and it's just so nice out today. I didn't think you know I, my face may be a little darker in contrast to the back because of the light coming in, but I just thought it's so pretty out there. Look at that anyway. Um, you know, you can hear my voice, but it's, it's nice to see. Yeah, thanks, Link. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's nice to see the, the sun out and, and the outs. And you know you live in Northeast Ohio when you count the nice days. You know, <laughs> everywhere else, it's like, man, we had three cloudy days this summer. Well, we got, we got to take advantage of the nice days when we get them. So I hope everybody has some plans to maybe get out and go for a walk today and, you know, go where you're allowed to go and, you know, stay safe. But man, it's, it's really neat. And you can see why Jesus went out into nature a lot. You know, it's a way to commune with the Father and, you know, a way to um, just enjoy the creation and what he's made. You know, we were talking yesterday, Luke and I, how God made everything. So it's, you know, go out, take a walk today if you get a chance. Just be in nature, listen. Um, we shut our patio door here because someone was mowing grass, so we we didn't want that to be, you know, all over the all over the sound. But you know, it's just uh, you know, get out today if you can. It's really pretty. All right, well, let's get started here. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us again. And Lord, just for the things going on, you know, we. We may not understand it now, but we know through your will and your direction, it will make sense. And, you know, we can find, you know, your lesson out of it if we're looking towards your will, because you don't create pain, uh, but you guide us through it and you allow us to to manage it and see your will. And then you work through it too, Lord. You you work through things like this to show us, you know, what's what's important and also... Lord, maybe this will be a way to, to refocus and get us a proper direction for what you want. And we're thankful for everything that you do, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, a current event so far today that, you know, that I pulled yesterday was, you know, there seems to be light at the end of the tunnel as far as potential treatments. 
you know, for this virus that's going around and causing all these problems. And the FDA is actually fast tracking it. So, you know, Lord willing, if this is the vessel he chooses to kind of bring an end to this, then this thing will, you know, have positive results and it'll get in production quickly. And um, one thing that is right now, the way it's starting is that it's only going to be for the severely sick people. Once it is produced, they will be able to give it to people that maybe are on a ventilator or extremely ill. Uh, you know, if you have it but aren't hospitalized, they're, they're not going to give it to you. But there is some hope here with treatments and, and things that are going on. Um, ultimately, God's the physician. And, you know, we may have heard stories of, of talking to a friend the other day. Um, you know, somebody, his, his wife had it, and she was on bed rest for about three weeks, and she came through it and uh, didn't have to go to the hospital, but you know, she was able to, her body was able to defeat it at home. But, you know, God can take it away in the snap of a finger. And, you know, people, as they get tested, find out that they had it. You know, they may have had this virus and never knew it because their symptoms and were just never present. And, you know, again, we're, as we're going to read in the Bible, you know, when we look at the Old Testament, and we're going to start in the book of Joshua, if, if you didn't see the graphic about the message, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 1. But we live in a fallen world, and we live in a place where these things like this happen. Now, under the old law, where God was leading the children of Israel out of captivity, you know, there was, things were different. And, and we'll put it that way, and we'll start there. But if you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 7 through 9. So Joshua chapter 1, 7 through 9. The Bible says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And, of course, I'm reading from the New International Version, so if you have a different version, it may have sounded a little bit different. But under the law of Moses and and with the children of Israel, when they were leaving Egypt, going to the Promised Land, God gave them a very specific directive. He said, if you do this, you're going to be fine. Now, as, as we look back, we can see that they didn't stick to what God said to do, and they weren't fine much of the time. In fact... You know, a little pretext to this. What had the children of Israel actually been through? Well, they had been through slavery in Egypt. They survived the plagues of Egypt, but they they saw it go on. They were chased down by the Egyptian army. Miracles were done all over the place to preserve them, preserve their life. But there was disease, snakes, pestilence. At one point, God opened up the earth and swallowed up lots of people. There were many, many things that the children of Israel had to endure because they broke God's laws. And it's very specific. He said, if there's any sin in the camp, and in the case of Achan, we know what happened there. If there's sin in the camp, disaster bef- you know, would befall the Israelites. And that's what they lived under. They were terrified. Now, uh, when this actual passage started, the children of Israel actually had to go through and they had to wander in the wilderness for a long, long time, 40 years. And what God was doing was he was, up until this point, the people that doubted him, that didn't believe they could take the promised land, God said, okay, this generation is going to die. And what he meant was not everybody. There were children, the women. But he said the men of military age were going to die because they were scared to go up and take the promised land. So they were, you know, their fear resulted in the punishment of not being able to see the promised land that God provided for them. So that was was a hefty, hefty penalty for not trusting in the Lord. So after all that had happened, 40 years had gone by, it was their time. It was their time to go up and take the land. So let's go to Joshua chapter 5. So just flip a couple pages over. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 4 through 9. So Joshua 5, 4 through 9. says, Now this is why he did so. 
All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had, been, had not. Now at the time, circumcision was just a physical representation of the covenant. And before this passage here, Joshua was, as they were getting ready to, to accept the promise that God had offered them 40 years prior, he went through and, and redid the covenant and circumcised the men of fighting age the way that they should have because the, the young men that were born in the wilderness during the 40 years of wandering didn't have that project, didn't have that covenant done to them. He said, verse 6, the Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly pro promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in, the, in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. And verse 9 is the key. So they went through all of that. And here's what God says in Joshua 5, verse 9. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So this place had been called Gilgal to this day. So when you read all the books of the Bible up until this point, the accounts that Moses gave and Joshua, the things that the Israelites had been through, 40 plus years of travel, wander, and things happening to them, God said after they had I guess been through their punishment and kept the covenant that God prescribed from the beginning. He said, now, today, I'm going to get rid of basically the stench of Egypt on you. Now is when you're ready to go. So looking at the children of Israel and what they had been through, you know, a lot, we joke that, you know, the hindsight is 2020. And Paula told me yesterday that, you know, 2020, the year 2020, look at what's gone on in the year 2020 so far. Um, it'll be nice when that's in the rearview mirror. And it just, it, this, this year's been something else. But 40 years of wandering and quarantine as a nation, not being able to go to the place that you want to go, that you're promised. And God says now, okay, today we're ready to go. They were scared. And that's why in the earlier chapters, God was giving them encouragement saying, don't be afraid. Just be courageous. Just do what I tell you and you'll be fine. And remember, when I kind of prefaced all this earlier, that this had to do with the Old Testament law, the law of Moses, where if you followed these things and did these things, you know, God was going to be with you and bless you. And looking back at this, I am so glad that we're on this side of the cross. And we're going to get more into that here. But one more place here, uh, passage before we transition into the New Testament. Turn to the book of Psalms. It's right in the middle of your Bible. If you've got it, open it to the middle. You're going to be pretty close. So it's going to be Psalm 91. Psalm chapter 91. If you're in a bad mood or upset or stressed out, just read Psalms. Psalm 91. And I'm going to start, well, let's just read the chapter. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the All. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord, who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. Now verse 11, now pay attention to these next few verses here. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now where have we heard that before? If you've primarily read through the New Testament and read about Jesus, who quoted that to Jesus when he was tempting him? Satan. Satan quoted him. And I bring these things out because 
we need to be careful that we don't fall into a theology that says, if you have enough faith, if you do the right things, that you won't get sick, that bad things won't happen. Okay, then we're kind of transitioning into the side of the cross that we live on right now. Yes, back in the days of the Old Testament, the children of Israel had a, like a checklist. Like, do this, don't do that, and you'll be okay. In the book of Psalms, you know, David, I'm sure, heard all these stories as a child and knew that, look, if you just do what you're supposed to do, you know, terror isn't going to befall you as a nation. And Satan tried to use this passage to quote it to Jesus. He said, look, go ahead and jump off this building because, you know, the Bible said, you know, the angels are going to basically pick you up and not let you hurt, you know, stub your toe even. But Jesus knew what Satan's motives were. And Satan can use those same motives to discourage Christians today by saying, see, look, there's no God because we have this coronavirus going around the world and killing people. You know, or you could take that internalize it and say, man, I must have done something wrong to deserve this. Now, we, it's, it's a fine balance of, yes, there are consequences for actions, and God will punish the wicked. But at the same time, as, and as we're going to read in the New Testament here, things like this, living in a fallen world, are going to happen. And it doesn't mean that it's because that you sinned personally or that you deserve this. And again, all things are under God's will, and I want to be very careful about this because we will be punished for sins, and there may be consequences of our actions. You know, if you, like what Satan was trying to tempt Jesus to do, if you, and Jesus could have done this because he's God, but, you know, if you go jump off the Eiffel Tower, it's going to hurt. You know, you can't, we can't just quote Psalm 91 and jump off of a building. And we, we see that with, you know, the New Testament and the apostles and the early church that, you know, God also said, you know, there's gravity. <laughs> so he, he put us in this world to live. But what I'm trying to do is encourage you to say that, yes, even though bad things have happened for you, to you, it's not always your fault. You know, we live in a fallen world. And if there's no free will, if there's no choice, people can't choose to do bad things that have consequences to you. You know, the person or whatever, however this virus was started in China, didn't know that this was going to happen. Okay? Or they, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have done it. So, you know, yes, we know that the Lord is always in charge. Yes, we know that he is faithful. But we have to change our perspective on these things now on this side of the cross. And I'm going to use an example to illustrate a few things, and we'll go over a few other things about this. But let's turn to the New Testament. You know, God gave us the Old Testament for a reason, and we need to study it and know it. And But what we have is we have a shifting of the focus and the perspective from the Old Testament with the children of Israel, with their, the, the Levitical law and the law of Moses, to now on this side of the cross. So turn to the book of Colossians if you can. And we're going to go to chapter 2, and we're going to start verses 6 through 15. Colossians 2, 6 through 15. Now, on the titling of my Bible, it talks about, okay, now that we're in Christ, we're free from the law of Moses, where it says, if you do X, Y, and Z, you're going to be blessed and if you don't do this, then I'm going to send you know a pestilence upon you. It's, it's a different time now. So Colossians 2, verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith that you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you who have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority, in him you were also circumcised, and the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him, through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Now, there's a little bit of a look back on the old law of Moses with the circumcision, and now under this side of the cross, under grace, because Jesus fulfilled all those do this, don't do that, you know, A, B, C, D checklist laws, you know, the old circumcision that the, the man had to do in Joshua's time before they could enter into the, the promised land, we don't have to go through that anymore. Because Jesus did it not physically, but with his spirit and with his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. So through the power of his spirit in the, in the spirit world, 
you know, all these those physical laws have been fulfilled. So we don't have to go through those, do this, don't do that. If you do this, bad things will happen to you. That's not where we're at anymore. And we are made you know, justified now through faith in Jesus Christ, not by any type of law that we can keep. Verse 13 says, When you were dead in your sins and under the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the, the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So Jesus took the regulations that we used to have to live under if we were the children of Israel, which unless you're Jewish, you know, I'm not, I'm, my family's from, you know, mostly Britain and some, some in Italy and things like that. But, you know, I wouldn't have a chance at this point, but because God took the law and the regulations through Christ Jesus, nailed them to the cross and paid them in full, I can go to heaven now. So praise the Lord. And that's grace. It's not anything that I earned. It's not that I kept all the Levitical laws. Just by the pure love and grace of our Father, we all have a chance to be in heaven. It's amazing. Now, why is that important? In times like this, we need to look at our perspective. And, you know, again, it's hard to answer questions to people on why bad things happen to good people or children or people that never knew about the gospel or, you know... It, I can't answer those things, and I'm not even going to attempt to. But what we can do on this earth is make sure that our focus and our perception and what we're looking at is right. And I brought a visual aid here today. Recently, I started a new hobby, and, and you know, Paula will laugh because I get on kicks all the time. And when I get into something, I kind of nerd out. And just speaking of cameras, I had to go ahead and wait for our, our internet to buffer again. But this camera allows you to change your focus and perspective really easily. You know, it, it allows us to you know, make changes to things and how we view things. So this thing right here is a lens. Now this lens is something where there's, you know, if you know anything about cameras, there are so many lenses out there that you can buy. But what this thing does is it allows you to change how much light that you let into the picture. Now, in this particular lens, this lens lets me get right up close to something, and it opens this, and it's kind of, I'm trying to make sure you can see it through the camera. But this lets a lot of light in. What I'm kind of using as an analogy is, if we open our eyes to everything that's going on, and we lose our proper focus, things can get bad. Now, with a lens like that, when you have it wide open, and you let everything bombard your senses at once, there may be something that you can focus on, but everything around is blurry. And everything gets blurred. And, you know, if you have like a worry in your head or something that you're stuck on or something that you can't seem to conquer, it's because, you know, your, your focus isn't correct. Now, what you can do if you get what's called a telephoto lens, which I have not bought yet. Actually, I did, but it's on the way. It's in the mail, literally. But what it'll do, and my dog almost knocked over my tripod, but what you can do is <laughs> you can refocus and you can make your focus, that, that hole that I showed you, it's called aperture, you can make it super, super small and what it does is it, you're, you focus on one thing and then everything's clear. So you can have it wide open and maybe one thing will be in focus, which can be your worry and everything is blurred and you lose your perspective on what's important. But when you focus in like a laser with, you know, with all your intentions on the one thing, if it's Jesus, everything around it's in focus and you know what's going on. And what that kind of analogy that I did was, you know, you focus on Jesus and everything else is clear and it makes sense. So in a time like this, it's easy just to agonize over something and have, you know, you got your panicked eyes on, your crazy eyes, you're like a turkey looking for thunder. You know, everything is, is killing you, literally. The stress and the anxiety of times like this can literally kill you. You know, it, it shuts your body down. It does terrible things. But when you get your laser focus on Jesus and what we're really after, everything around it is clear, crisp, and you can see through times like this. And everything's not just, your, your head's not ready to explode. 
So when you only focus on Jesus, the Bible tells us that if you focus on the kingdom first, all the things that we worry about are going to be given to us. You know, it's talking like food, clothing, shelter, the basic necessities of life. But Jesus says, if you focus on me and on the kingdom, all these other things are going to be added to you because the thing is Jesus. So our relationship with Jesus is really, you know, the, our relationship with Christ is what's really important. And we need to focus on that. And we need to know that he is in control and that he has things, you know, handled. So if we zoom in on Christ and on the kingdom, whenever we have a time like this, it's not going to be as deadly stress-wise as what it is if we don't know, understand what our proper destination is, which is heaven. And set my visual aid down, but I have an example of this. And if you want to turn to your Bibles before we close here, we're going to be in Philippians. So turn your Bibles to Philippians 19. I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 1. If you go to Philippians 19, I don't know what version of the Bible you got because it doesn't exist. But go to Philippians chapter 1 and we're going to start at 19 through 26. Verse 19 says, For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Now Paul's talking about, of course, all the trials he went through, the beatings, the imprisonments. Verse 20, And I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is to Christ and to die is gain. Now, what does that mean? You know, Paul isn't saying that I'm guaranteed to have an easy life because I follow what Jesus says. He's saying, look, by either my life or my death, I'm going to be glorified. Because what happens if you're persecuted for the cause of Christ and you lose your life here? Where are you at? You know, if you have that proper lens that's focusing in on eternity, you're in heaven with, with the Lord. And no one can take that from you. And verse 21 says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am, excuse me, <clears throat> if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know! Exclamation point. So Paul is saying, look, I know while I'm here, I've got a job to do. And it's important for me that I do this job, but you know, what, what would I choose? He's struggling with it because he loves the children of Israel. He loves the Gentiles and he wants to be the witness that God wants him to be. You know, but also Paul wants, Paul wants to be in heaven with Christ. And he says, I am torn between the two. Verse 23, I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. So Paul is saying, look, I know it's better to be in heaven, but I'm here now to witness to you and to do the job that I'm called to do. So, you know, if you're worried about things that are not kingdom building, I challenge you to take your your mind and, and think of it like your telephoto lens and just narrow that field of view down and focus on one thing which is my mission here on earth. What am I put here for? Am I put here to make lots of money? No. Am I put here to have tons of stuff? No. Am I put here to go on the best vacations ever? No. And these things aren't bad as long as they're being used for Christ. What we're put here for is to spread the gospel and to have the idea that Paul did and to know that you know, okay, to be here, while I'm here, I'm going to work. And I'm going to witness and do the best that I can to bring people to heaven with me. But I know that ultimately they can kill me if they if they persecute me for the cause of Christ. Well, then I'm in heaven. So it's not really something comfortable to talk about, especially in a time like this where there's a disease going around and taking people's lives early. But what I want to challenge you to do is focus on eternity. Focus on heaven. Focus on our purpose of being here which is to witness and try to help other people understand who Jesus is. And when you focus on those things, the, the blurriness and the fog and the fears of this world, they'll start to come into focus and say, okay, I, you know, Lord, I don't know why this virus is going on, but don't let me miss an opportunity to witness to you, for, about you to others through this. So pray that the Lord will use you and release any fear, any panic that you have. Um, and we're going to pray. Number one, we're going to pray for salvation if someone hasn't ever accepted it, but we're also going to pray that God can use this you know, for his will and use you as a part of his will. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we just ask that we can actually 
find some meaning through all this in your will and not through our own will or not our own lens, but help us to focus on you, Lord. Narrow our field of view just to focus on you and your kingdom and everything else will come into focus. And Lord, we just know that you know, through all of this, you are working and we ask to be the vessel that you work through. And Lord, just give our ourselves and our church direction come in as we come out of this. Help us not to be afraid like you encouraged the children of Israel and you said, okay, now today's the day that you're ready. Help us to be courageous like you told them multiple times and to go forward and, and do whatever ministry you've called us to do. Lord, if somebody here today is not saved, keep knocking on the door of their heart and know that by faith in you, uh, you tell us very clearly that believing in you as our Savior, we can have eternal life and we can have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's a, it's a circumcision not done by hands, but by the Spirit, by our faith in you, Lord. And we're asking for that covenant. And um, eternal life is, is a free gift only given by grace through you, Lord. And just ask that you give us direction. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for everybody, and we just ask that you know you guys st continue to stay safe and continue to push in and seek the Lord. You know, get as close to Him as you can through all this, through the isolation, and make this about um, you know don't waste an opportunity and don't waste time you know while we're shut in to to try to get closer to the Lord and make sure that you know we're in His will and that you are knowing what He wants you to do. So thank you everybody, and um, go enjoy this day.